So, good morning everybody, and or afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining us for this IFLA webinar on the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation for its members, and our members' members. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard a lot about the General Data Protection Regulation. Hopefully, you're feeling already a little bit confident about how to do it, but we're lucky to have uh, in our membership a couple of people who are particularly experts in this, who have been kind enough to to offer to share their expertise, to tell us a little bit more about how how this affects libraries, what it means, and hopefully get you into a situation where you're even more confident. Um, we are recording this webinar, and this recording will be available subsequently. Um, there will also hopefully be time at the end for questions and answers. I will suggest that we do questions and answers written in the group chat, and I hope you can see the icon for chat at the bottom of the screen. So first of all, I'm very glad to welcome Mr. Benjamin White. He's the head of intellectual property at the British Library, and he will talk about the general context and generally what's in the general data protection regulation. So over to you, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, just in terms of the order, if people have got questions, because I'm I'm um, sh screen sharing, I can't see any questions. So Stephen, would it be possible for you to read any questions out? Absolutely. Thank you very much. So, um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Ben White. I work at the British Library and I've been working on GDPR uh, and its implementation in the UK. And I also uh, have trained in uh, data protection law. Um, and myself and my colleague Lena from the Royal Library in Copenhagen, as well as Aarhus University in Denmark, uh, have definitely two presentations and depending on time, a third presentation um, that we're going to give. So the order of the day is I will be um, giving a overall presentation about the general data protection regulation in terms of the law and I'm um, sorry I'm getting strange feedback I don't know if, um, if there's anything we can do about it maybe that's just the way the system is so I'll do as I said I'll do the first presentation which is about the general data protection regulation and establish some of the main principles um, Stephen has gone okay I should just yeah. have to carry on yeah, uh, there's there's kind of lots of keyboard sounds and feedback and whooshing I don't know is that just how it is I think you're the only one who isn't muted at the moment right okay so is it you then <laughs> no no I've, I've muted myself but I could just oh, check if everyone else can mute themselves system. that would be good yeah so I'll be doing a legal introduction and then Lena will be doing a, a more of a practical um, um, look at some of the things that they've, she's been doing at Aarhus University in the National Library in, in, in Denmark. So, so it starts off with theory and then we move to, to sort of practical implementation. Um, <clears throat> as many of you will be aware the general data protection regulation comes into force across the European Union on the 25th of May next month um, and it's had a long passage uh, from originally it was a European directive and uh, around 2011 and 2012 it was felt that uh, across the European Union we needed more harmonized privacy uh, and data protection laws um, and as many of you will be aware this is becoming more and more of a contentious issue uh, certainly since the Snowden revelations people have become more aware of data privacy issues and recently uh, we have the Cambridge Analytica and Facebook scandal where people's personal data appears to have been used um, for, for political purposes by private companies and private individuals for financial gain, unknown to, to, to those individuals. So um, I think it's safe to say that privacy and online privacy 
of which data protection forms an important part, is is an issue that is just going to grow and grow and grow for libraries and research organisations. So first of all, what is personal data? Um, personal data is anything that allows you to identify a living person. And it includes not just um, facts about a living individual, it also includes opinions about an identifiable living person. So examples of personal data include names, addresses, as I said, opinions of a named or identifiable person, kind of ID numbers, passport numbers, library card numbers, um, and, and, and as I said, you don't, as, as long as you can identify a living individual, um, that, that then brings data protection law into scope. So those of you that have been following the Brexit um, developments in the UK, and one of our um, ministers may, may be able to, just from this quote, uh, know that I'm referring to uh, our Foreign uh, Secretary of State, Foreign Minister Boris Johnson, you don't need to um, have his name, you don't need to have his address, his email, it, it's just identifiable from, from the information stated there. So, so, in a sense, it's anything that allows you to identify a living person. And data protection law has two categories, it has personal data, and then it has sensitive personal data, or, or what in the law is referred to as special categories of data. And again, these are um, laid out in, in, in the law, and they vary from kind of religious views and, and, and affiliations, philosophical, you know, are you an atheist, your political affiliations, your information relating to your sex life and your sexuality, trade union activities, um, any criminal or, or, or alleged criminal behavior, your racial or ethnic um, status, anything to do with medical and health, and also membership of societies. So, so again, we have two categories of data. We have standard personal data, as well as sensitive personal data. And kind of one of the mi misunderstandings perhaps of of data protection law is that it only refers to sensible, sensitive personal data. That isn't the fact. Um, it, it refers to both personal data, which is is, is not you know, can be sensitive. It's something that allows you to identify an individual, and then these these other um, types of personal data which are, are sensitive. And the rules regarding use of sensitive personal data are subtly but importantly different to, to, to use of personal data. So in, in addition to um, the, those key terms, we have other terms which will come up. We have a data controller, and a data controller is an organization, a person who decides the purpose and how to use the personal and sensitive personal data. So the key terms here is the purpose for using the data and how it is to be used. And if you make those two decisions, you are the person that controls the data, the data controller. We have the data processor, somebody who simply carries out work under instruction from the controller of the data. So essentially, they, they, they don't decide uh, the purpose for which the data is uh, undertaken. They might decide technically how to process the data, but that um, is, is a purely kind of a technical decision, really kind of how the data will be used, other than in a purely technical sense, is, is a decision made by the data controller. So we have this concept of personal data, we have data controllers, we have data processors, and 
And a good example of a data processor is a web hosting service. All they're doing is deciding um, how to host and technically the best way of hosting information. So again, they're just performing the technical activity under instruction from the person who is making the decisions around how the website should look, what personal data is available, how it's available. So that's kind of a nice, easy example of the data process. And then each European member state will have a supervisory authority. And that's a governmental body which is in charge of regulating data protection law. So in the UK and Ireland, that's called the Information Commissioner's Office. And there are sort of similar titles in other European countries. So it's their, their, their um, responsibility to oversee in all the senses from infringements through to compliance whether whether, whether and to what extent organizations and individuals are complying with, with data protection law so what does data protection law do it's there to create and protect the personal data of uh, predominantly european citizens or rather i should say residents of the european union and European Union passport holders outside of the European Union. So it creates rights for people um, and therefore it puts obligations on data processors and data controllers to protect those rights. The, the supervisory authority has um, many different powers. Uh, it, 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 it makes rulings, it can levy fines up to 20, 000, 20 million euros. It can essentially uh, require cease and desist, type, assist, cease and desist um, type activities from organizations who are incorrectly using uh, personal data. And I suppose importantly for the kinds of institutions that we represent, it isn't just about the legal compliance, it's also reputationally, I think, important for libraries, universities, etc., to be seen to be protecting European citizens' personal data and acting appropriately with that data. So data protection law uh, puts in place some core principles around how um, data controllers and processors uh, should manage and use personal and sensitive personal data. So first of all, um, the use of personal data must be lawful. We'll talk a bit about that more in the second slide. Um, Personal data can only be used for specific processes. Um, so, so, for example, if you take and use personal data for one purpose and have permission for usage of that purpose, you can't suddenly decide to use that personal data for a different purpose unless there are clear legal grounds. So, for example, one common um, example of, 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 of using personal data is what is when you get consent. So, for example, I give permission for um, my university to use my personal data for sending me um, my alumni magazine twice a year. They can't suddenly, without me giving um, a consent again, uh, decide to sell me products you know they've, they've they've gathered my personal data for a certain specific purpose they've got my permission for that specific purpose they can't suddenly decide to use that personal data for something else and i'm simplifying slightly because there are other grounds but that that's a sort of a there are other grounds which may allow that but generally if you're using consent permission from the rights holder you can only do it for that specific purpose and you'll have to go back and ask permission if you want to use the data for a separate purpose. Another important principle is the data minimization principle. Uh, that basically says that you should not um, 
collect more data than you really need for the purpose for which you are collecting that data. So for example, uh, I remember a couple of years ago with my children, I wanted to um, set up a meeting to discuss opening the bank accounts for my children. And that was all done online, setting up that meeting. And they were asking all sorts of information. They wanted my passport number. They wanted to know my mortgage status. Um, totally excessive for the purpose of going in to have a discussion for my children about opening a bank account. So you've always got to ask yourself, am I collecting more data than I really need for the purpose at hand? Um, accurate and up-to-date, uh, the, the data should be kept accurate and up-to-date, that kind of speaks for itself. Incorrect data, uh, for example, your phone number, your mortgage status, your credit card status, is your, your religion, it can, it can cause all sorts of problems if the data isn't kept up-to-date. Another principle is, you know, you, you should not use data for longer than is required. So that's quite open-ended. It depends what the purpose is, but you shouldn't just hold on to personal data because it might be useful at some time in the future. This is about, again, collecting data for a specific purpose, and then when you don't need the data anymore, not holding on to that personal data. And then the sixth principle is operation and technical security. Ensure that yours, all your systems, physical and technological, are protecting um, personal data. So for example, ensure your, your patches, your software patches are kept up to date, that your malware is, is kept up to date wherever you may be using that data. So those are the six data protection principles we see in the general data protection regulation. And the first one is uh, legal, transparent, and lawful processing is principle number one. And what this basically means, um, simplifying slightly, is that you need a legal grounds for using personal data. And there are actually separate legal grounds for processing sensitive personal data, but I, um, I, I don't think we've got time to go in, in, into that. So I'm just talking about personal data here. So there are six grounds. Consent, we've already discussed. I've asked you, can I use your personal data? You've said yes, and provided that personal data. In a medical emergency, um, you know, people can access, without permission, your medical history. Um, this is an interesting one, which um, is being tightened up. Essentially, if you are an organization which is subject to freedom of in information legislation, so if you're subject to FOI, um, depending on the country, you can no longer use this grounds or in certain European Union countries, you can use grounds three for using personal data when the activity is outside of your public task. So this three um, is one that many public bodies can no longer use. And basically what this is saying is, you can use personal data if it um, does not unduly harm the interests of the data subject, the person whose data is being used. There's like a balancing test. Does my use as the data controller harm the legitimate interests of the person whose, whose, whose data I am using? So this is, a, this is one which um, I, I suspect in the Cambridge Analytica case, a lot will hinge on was Cambridge Analytica's profiling activities harmful to the interests of the data subject? So again, it doesn't require content, it's, it's, it's a balancing act. But as I said, one which public authorities can, in many member states, no longer use, or in certain European member states, 
in certain instances only where the productivity falls outside the public task can this be relied on. Contractual relationships, if you're in, entering into a contract, for example, um, you're applying for a credit card, then you're entering into a contract or a job, you're signing up for a new job, then there are certain um, that's the grounds for using personal data and, and, and that will affect your, your, your rights as a data subject um, downstream. So essentially, so another one is legal obligation or number six, it's necessary for performing a task in the public interest or in the exercise of official authority. So again, here, Basically, if, if, if you have a statute obligation to perform a task or you have loose statute based on underpinning like libraries do and education establishments do, then you have a clear public task linked to your legislative underpinning. So again, that can be a grounds for using personal data. So essentially, in order for your use of personal data to be legal, you've got to have one of these six grounds in order for you to use the personal data. So this is something that I'm sure Lena will be talking about, that you have to be very clear now in all your activities that relate to the use of personal data, what is my legal grounds for using it? Because that needs to be made public. So people need to know what activities you're performing and what your legal grounds are for performing those activities relating to the use of personal data. So as with most information law and most bodies of law, it creates responsibilities for certain individuals and rights for others. So um, that's the same in, in, in copyright, there are responsibilities and obligations and, and, and and rights is created. So responsibilities of data controllers, there are lots of them, and Lena will be talking in, in more kind of practical detail about this. So I've just outlined a few of them here. One is to comply with the data protection principles, which we've just discussed, those six principles. Another obligation on data controllers is to, to be transparent about how you're using personal data. So if you're relying on consent, you need to be explicit and explain clearly how you're going to use that personal data. In your privacy notices on your website or information sheets for individuals, you need to be transparent exactly how you are using personal data, for what purposes, where the, where the data sits, what your grounds for using the personal data is. So transparency. Is very important. Another important responsibility is if you're a public authority for sure you will need a data, data protection officer. Um, private companies it, it will depend on certain activities so the more personal data you are using, the more monitoring you're doing of individuals, um, the more sensitive personal data or criminal data you're using then you will need a data protection officer. Um, the UK Information Commissioner's Office has said, you know, slightly tongue-in-cheek, but if you're only doing two things, the most important things are four and five. Focus on your technical, technological and organisational security. Protect the data in terms of your online and offline systems. Update your privacy notice. Ensure that your privacy notice is easy to understand, that it exactly shows your grounds for processing personal data, who you're sharing that personal data with, where the personal data sits, and what the rights of, in, of, person, of, of data subjects are in the law. At the moment, um, there is some level of notification, so you have to supply information about your data processing uh, activities with these supervisory authorities. So in the UK, there's a fee and you have to register with the Information Commissioner's Office, for example, 
um, that is no longer required. So you don't, going forward, unless you've got a data protection officer, have to contact the supervisory authority to let them know about your data processing activities. You now have to record that information and hold it locally. So there's certain information sets that you're now to re required by law to hold yourself as an organization. You're also, again, required where there is likely to be an impact on uh, data subjects. So if you're implementing new IT systems or new, or in, or new ways of doing things, you have to do what's called a privacy impact assessment if, if it's likely that your new processes will have a significant or material impact on, on, on um, how piece of people's personal data is going to be used. So we have to assess, will our new systems and new processes affect data subjects? And if the answer is yes, then you may or may not have to rethink what you're doing. So really it's an opportunity uh, and a way of getting organizations to actively think about personal data as part of their normal business as usual activities. In certain instances, if there's a data breach, so data has been lost or, 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 or hacked into or destroyed, um, and if that's likely to cause damage and distress, then uh, that has to be reported to your national authority. And you need to analyze all your data transfers, your data sharing with other organizations, because they, they need to be in your con that needs to be accurately reflected in, in contracts. You need to establish are you the data controller? Are they the data processor? Are you joint data controllers? And law also has particular um, obligations on data controllers when material is exported outside of the European economic area. So now we're sort of finishing up in a sense. So we've looked at the obligations on data controllers. What is it that they have to do to comply with the law? Um, we've looked a little bit um, and I suppose that we're, and, and we've looked a little bit at the rights of, of data subjects. So you have rights in law as people when your data is being used. So you have this new right, which is called data portability. So for example, you have the right for your personal data to be moved from one bank to another. Or for example, uh, if you don't want your data to be on Facebook and there's a Facebook rival, you can require Facebook to move your personal data and supply it to your new hosting organization. So that's a new right, data portability. You have the right, which we've discussed quite a lot, to be informed of how your data is being used. You've got the right to be informed when it's being trans. Um, shared outside of the European economic area. You have the right for your, your data to be updated. You have the right to stop processing. I, I don't want you to use my data anymore. Um, and you have the right that other bodies are informed um, that your data has been amended or erased. Um, so the, the data controller will have to do that in certain instances. So these are the kind of the theoretical rights that data subjects have, amendment, portability, deletion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the law then creates exemptions to those rights. So as you can imagine, most of these rights do not apply when it's national security. Um, we're probably, as organizations, not so interested in national security, but we are interested in archiving, we are interested in research, and we are interested in freedom of expression. So as you can imagine, for archiving, if people have the right to delete the data, then 
you can't archive. So that's one of the examples um, or, or exemptions that we have in, in the new archiving and the public interest exemption. Um, research exemptions also. So again, there are exemptions for research. Um, so one of the examples is uh, for research, you don't have to tell data subjects if it's not practicable that you are undertaking research on their personal data. So that's not an absolute right, it's sort of ameliorated somewhat. But um, again, there are exemptions which facilitate research. And the other uh, exemption that we're interested in is, is freedom of expression and information. Again, if people could assert all their rights, then there are freedom of expression uh, issues because they can, they could theoretically allow you not to use their personal data. Well, what the law does is say, well, there's a public interest test here that your rights as a data citizen need to be balanced with freedom of expression, freedom um, archiving and research. So, the, so, so what the law does is it creates exemptions, i.e. certain instances where the, the, the rights of data subjects can no longer be exercised. So that was quite quick and there was a lot of information there. I'm wondering, are there any questions on that? So thank you, Ben, for that. So I think if there are questions for clarification, I suggest that you put those in the chat box and we can answer them now. Otherwise, I guess that Lena can get her presentation ready and then we can, then we can move on there. So, are there any questions for clarification? I think everyone seems happy. Very good. So I've either, either done a brilliant job or an appalling job. <laughs> as I said, we, we, we are recording this, so clearly, as Ben said, that was a lot of information. So there will be, you'll have more than enough opportunity to re-listen to think through to, to work out which things seem most or least troubling hopefully and then we can share we can check you can contact if headquarters later and we will share questions with Ben and Lena thank you so I think that Lena's ready so I'm going to mute myself and we'll hand over to Lena thank you for the introduction, Ben, my name is Lena Slemming and I work as a legal advisor at the Royal Danish Library. I will give a few examples how we have been implementing the GDPR regulation at the Royal Danish Library. So just... If you can all see the presentation. Yes, we can see it, Lena. Can you see the agenda? Yes. Okay. So for the first of all, um, the organization of the Royal Danish Library and the implementation activities. So when we started to look at this more than a year ago, we took a good look at the recital four and the regulation saying that the implementation should be proportional to protect. So there are some uh, fundamental rights, but there's also a proportionality principle that we have used while we were implementing the, the regulation. First of all, I would like to show you the, the organization. So we made a, Organ uh, organization where they appointed a data protection officer who was a IT security specialist and we made a supporting team for the DPO with a um, head of IT infrastructure and legal advisors including myself so I'm now looking at the section in the middle the responsibilities for this group was to implement a uh, 
make policies and templates, found the legal basis for the different activities within the library, ensure that the technical measurements for handling personal data and sensitive personal data were in place as of May 2018. And the th last thing that we're now starting uh, within a few weeks is education of librarians all over the library. I think this is a really important task and I look forward to, to starting that. Further, the Ministry of Culture in Denmark had made a, a network for cultural institutions in Denmark where we have uh, shared our progress in uh, implementing the GDPR. The overall responsibility for the implementation was placed at the Deputy Director General at the library. And we have had a very good collaboration where um, we make sure that the policies and templates that the teammates is uh, cleared within the management of the library. And most importantly, we have a committed collaboration between the different sections of the library with the deputy directors and a dedicated project manager in each division. Because as a, a implementing team, we cannot know all the personal data that is in a large library. So we rely on the uh, knowledge in each division on where personal data could be found uh, among many places in the collections within the users in each division. So the collaboration with the, the divisions is to document and comply. And lastly, we invented this new title for the librarians, namely the dark data, data detectives, where they sort of get a, a, a tool on how to identify dark data, meaning the data, personal data that has not yet been identified within the library. I will get back to that later. So our work is based on the basic principles that Ben went you through. They are found in recital um, 39 in the GDPR regulation. And I think Ben went that through that very thoroughly. So I will just give a few examples of the implementation activities. So this is a example of our DPO who is gone around the library and search for personal data, both within the collections and lending registries, newsletters, websites. Personal data can also be a photograph or an image. So if you have had a session and you took pictures and posted on your website, that could also be personal information. So there are lots of different types of personal information within a library. The next step was to document the different personal data activities within um, the, the library. And for that, there is both the processes and the procedures of who is responsible for having a legal basis or having the consent from the data subject, who is responsible if a data subject later requests to have his data um, withdrawn or deleted from the library. So tools to ensure compliance of registered person's rights. And also procedures for a state of alert in case of breach as Ben mentioned. Lastly, there is in, in the Danish implementation of the GPR a requirement for a yearly audit of all personal data activities. And that's quite a big um, task for the library. So we're looking into how we can make like a, a streamline of uh, audit process so that we can do it at the same time at all the different data um, archives. So one of the requirements in the GDPR regulation is that you should have a, a overview of the electronic records of processing activities. So we, as of now, have identified a little more than a hundred records of persisting of personal data. And I made like two categories of records. One where we have uh, personal data on library users and one where we have personal data within the collections. 
So I'll start with the library users. If we have personal data and the registered lenders. We have a lending history due to the, the ethical norms in the library society. We delete those within a short time of period. We have courses and teaching activities where users sign up. We have some different licenses that uh, each lenders can can have an, a license to a software tool or to a subscription of a e-magazine. And for that purpose, we need their name and their registration uh, history. And lastly, I think everyone has a, a newsletter where we have to make sure that there's a consent to receive those newsletters and be careful about the purpose you have put in those consents. Within the collections, we have two like big uh, areas of collections. We have the legal deposit collections, which are published materials from Denmark. And uh, so newspapers, books, commercials, TV, radio, and of course those collections contains a huge amount of personal data. Secondly, we have private archives and collections, collections that the library has started itself or collection that has been donated or bought by the library. For example, we have private archives of famous Danish writers and their letters uh, throughout their life to their relatives or author colleagues. And those letters contain a lot of personal data that we have to um, analyze and make a record of. So I'll just spend a few words because Ben also mentioned this in his presentation. But what we have looked in, into concerning the collections referred to in the article 89 is that if you are processing personal data for archiving purposes, there may in national law be some derogations from the rights. And the rights I have put in here is the right to access by the data subject. We've been struggling with having an exception to this because it's a fundamental principle in Danish public law that a person should be able to gain knowledge on which data a public government has, cons has uh, in his um, records concerning the data subject. What we have been successful with is to have an exemption concerning the right to rectification. And that is an argument that we build on the, the, the statement that you cannot have an archive where data is changed over time. So it has to be accurate as it was when it was firstly given into the library. Uh, and further, we, the procession of the data is for the legal grounds that are laid down in the legal deposit acts so we don't see any further processing uh, possibilities and i think it's worthwhile to mention that the the right to be forgotten that has got a lot of publicity in the media does not apply for archiving purposes so there you do not need a national legislation for that exception it is uh, applies directly from Article 17 in the GDPR. So once uh, all the personal data um, archives has been identified, as I said, more than 100, we have to document them. And the basic guideline on transparency has forced us to make a lot of uh, information on a website, will be, be, be enrolled on the website within uh, May in form of that we gather personal information within the Legal Deposit Act because people should know that once they publish, even though we think it's very uh, common knowledge, many people do not know that their publications or their posts on the Danish web are collected and stored within the library. So we should inform that on a website. We made a lot of policies concerning, for example, simple policies for, for cookies on the website, policies for 
disclosure in photos and streaming uh, from uh, arrangements at the library. We have made um, policies concerning access to legal deposits collections and a policy for librarians to to handle the personal uh, contact that you have in front of uh, the users within the library disk where they ask for uh, for example if they ask for lending history and you have multiple lenders on your screen that you make sure that the other lenders are not able to see the personal data and finally we have uh, identified up to I think it's around 50 re relationships where we are either a data controller or a data processor so we started to make a lot of data processing agreements with instructions on how to uh, handle the personal data for example we have a newsletter that is posted and sent out through an US uh, service provider. That means that the data is going outside of EU. Third party countries, there's a EU processing agreement that needs to be in place there. Otherwise we have a data processing agreement once we service the universities. And I just put in a link because the Danish uh, Data Protection Agency has actually made a template in a UK version for data processing agreement which is quite useful if you will have a look at that at some point. Finally, we're about to start a education program for the librarians at the library here in early May. And the education is for the librarians to have a new title as doctor data detectives. And the education program is to create awareness on the use and sharing of personal data. So if you're on your laptop or your screen has some personal data, say a job application, you print it out, but what do you do with the print or the handout later? Is it stored safely? Do you bring it home? Or what happens to the data? So what we are focusing on now is to educate the librarians in identifying uh, personal data and to bear in mind what they're doing with the, the data outside the electronic records. So that was going through how we implemented the, the, the DPR at the Royal Danish Library in a, in a brief overview, I would say, because it takes a lot of work to, to uh, go through all your records with personal information. So thank you, thank you, Lena, very much. So we already have a couple of questions in. So one I can answer is, will the PowerPoint presentations be shared with the participants? And the answer is yes, we'll, we'll put them up alongside the recording. More technical one for you, Lena. Um, this is from Katrina. Did you work with the data in the institutional repository PURE, P-U-R-E? Yeah, well, for, for the data, it's a registry of publications that the researchers from the university has. And for that registry, the university is the data controller and the library is the data processor. So there will be a, a data processor agreement in place. So we also a university library, the Danish Royal Library. So there are a lot of collaborations where it needs to be very careful whether the university or the library is the data controller. Thank you. And there's a couple of questions from Igor. Um, first one is, have you or will you request again consent from your people who receive your newsletter? So people who are already receiving things, are you asking them to confirm? And I guess this goes to both to Ben and to Lena. Yes, we plan to do that. Oh, Ben, I'm going to unmute you. Unless you can unmute yourself. <laughs> You're unmuted. <laughs> um, we, I think the real answer is it 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 de it depends. It depends on um, the original consent that we've got. So if we got consent to begin with, 
we don't think that we need to go back and ask for consent again. Um, but if, if we were relying on, for example, the legitimate interests grounds where we can no longer rely on that, yes, we will have to go back to them again. So in some instances we are going back and in other instances we aren't. Excellent, thank you. There's a second question from Igor. Um, will you be providing on your website a document that sets out the information you collect and the information that you use? Yes. <laughs> that was easy. So, Lena? So, yeah. so that's, that's the privacy notice that I referred to. So there is a lot, um, there's a, in, in, in the GDPR, it's quite prescriptive, the information that you have to have in your privacy notice, uh, which should go on, on, on the website. So again, your, the types of personal data you hold, your legal grounds for holding it, who you're sharing it with, maybe how long you're keeping it for, um, is it going beyond the EEA? What are the data subject rights? Data subject rights. So there's a, the, the, the GDPR is very specific on the kinds of information that you need to have um, in, 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 in your privacy notice. And I guess, I guess if either of you can share the privacy notices that you'll be using, that could be a really useful resource for people. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a, a question from MN, a, a, a more of a student in there. Can you explain how you're dealing with the data you hold on lending histories? I'm aware this is probably more relevant for public libraries, but... Yeah, so we ha if the books are returned within uh, due course, the lending history will be deleted within four weeks. Oh. Gosh, we take a very different approach. <laughs> um, we, as a national library, um, for published material, we, we keep it, I think, for 25 years, and for unpublished, uh, much longer. Um, and I think in terms of public libraries in the UK who are lending material that's not unique, I think, you know, we think it can be a lot shorter than the 25 years that we have. Yeah, so the four weeks were for, for public libraries, what, what we have within the library. The national collections, we keep a record for, I think it's up to a year on who has had access to the unique uh, items within the collections. Excellent. We have a question from Arvid about, and this I think is more aimed at Lena. Have you, but I guess it could also be applicable to Ben, have you defined the Royal Library Denmark as a data processor when it comes to interlibrary loans? Mm. No, I don't think we have that as of mm. yet because we see more as a transfer of data from one data controller to another. So if a lender requests a book that we do not have, we, ha we are... Um, asking that person to accept that we are uh, transferring his request to a different library. Ben, is this something you thought about at the British Library? I suppose my question is quite a specific one. When, when, when you mean interlibrary loan, are we talking about a physical item or are we talking about document supply? I mean, generally, I'm more familiar with document supply at the British Library. We, we, we often don't get um, the personal data anyway. It's just, you know, this organisation wants this article. And there's a, so, there's a, there's a follow-up question on that, just to say that um, it was clarifying that question. That do you need to have a separate agreement with each and every library about exchange of data? I guess it's what do we mean by <laughs> this exchange of, of, of data? I mean, if you really are sharing personal data, then you, you should have agreement, yes, with everyone you're sharing personal data with. Okay. 
But if there's you identify a, an, yourself as two controllers who are transferring data, okay, you, thank you. you kind of Sorry. need the consent from the subject rather than an agreement between the two institutions. Thank you, I think that's, that's clear. Um, going back to the question about keeping lending, lending histories, what's the specific legal grounds for keeping these lending histories? There's a, you should, in the new, as Ben said, one of the basic principles is like data minimization. How long do you need to keep the data? Um, um, no, but on, on, on what basis can you keep that data? Yeah. Well, if there's a need to document who has accessed uh, for security reasons, or mm -hmm. if you have a, a find out later that a part of an item has been stolen or things like that, you have to see whose person have had access to that item. So it's, it will be for security reasons. Yeah. How will that apply to lend it to public libraries where the risk of theft is less? Well, that's, that's why in, when we get asked this question about public libraries, we say that although we keep the national collection, and again, we, we're from a collection management perspective of the national collection, we also have this horrible term, the library of last resort, um, our security of our collections is very, very important. For a public library, we, we, we think these what are called retention schedules. They don't need to keep the data for anywhere near as, as long as, as we do, for example. And on, on, just to clarify, on, on what basis would public libraries be keeping this data? Is it legitimate interest, its operational requirements? No, I, th I think it should be the legal obligation and performance of a task in the public interest. So, so generally, it's always best to avoid consent. <laughs> so, so it could be, you know, look at statutes in, in, in that, that underpins your library activities. Um, I think, you know, there's a public task in the provision of library, library services and educational services. I mean, it, it could also be contract, you know, you're entering into a contract for a particular service. I mean, generally, it's always better to avoid consent where you can, because because it, as the data controller, you, um, you you have more power, as it were, and and le the data subjects have less rights than they can um, exert. So, consent can be withdrawn, and that can cause all sorts of problems for your organisation, which is why. It's always better if you can, and I think libraries can, in many instances, in terms of many of their activities, rely on um, legal obligation and, and public task. Thank you. So we've come to the end of our hour. Um, what we will do is, um, first of all, I will share my email on the chat box if, that's, if anyone has any further questions, and then I can share them with Ben and Lena. Um, this recording will go up on the website website shortly. We'll put it in the event page where I hope you found the link to this webinar. And very quickly, thank you very much to Ben and to Lena for your time, for your ideas. Thank you to everyone for, for joining in. And hopefully we'll see you at a future webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Lena. Bye. <laughs>